Hello, um, I'm Rebecca Morris. I'm the Executive Director of the Law, Ethics, and Animals Program, or LEAP, at Yale Law School. We're very excited to be hosting this event in partnership with the Yale Sustainable Food Program, the Yale Animal Law Society, and the Yale Environmental Law Association. If you're interested in receiving updates about future events in our ongoing speaker series, we encourage you to sign up for LEAP's email newsletter, and we'll put a link to that in the chat. We are uh, really thrilled to have Austin Frerich here with us today. Austin, uh, as anyone knows who knows him, is a force to be reckoned with and a very bright star of the growing movement to, as he once put it, put the anti back in antitrust. He is the deputy director of the Thurman Arnold Project at Yale Law School, or at Yale, um, which is an initiative that brings together faculty, students, and scholars from the law school, from the Yale School of Management, and beyond to collaborate on research related to competition policy and antitrust enforcement. As a quick side note, LEAP and the Thurman Arnold Project are co-hosting a virtual conference on January 16 of 2021 that is going to explore the role of antitrust and competition law and policy in creating America's food system and its potential for making it more sustainable and humane going forward, um, both for people and animals alike. And so we'll post a link to that in the chat too for anyone who's interested in registering or submitting an abstract. In addition to his role at Yale, Austin is a fellow at the Harkin Institute at Drake University and a senior fellow for, um, at Data for Progress. Um, for years, he's been a leading and really brilliant voice, both in explaining the root problem of corporate concentration in agriculture and its consequences, and also in envisioning policy solutions to try to better protect rural America, people, farm animals, and our democracy from abuses of monopoly power. In 2018, when Austin was still in his 20s, he ran for Congress in Iowa's third district, uh, winning the endorsement of Congressman Ro Hanna, um, Ro Khanna, excuse me, and others. Um, and he made the fight against corporate agribusiness monopolies the centerpiece of his campaign. Um, I hope he'll run again in the future, but in the meantime, we're really lucky to have him here at Yale um, and excited and honored to have him speak with us today. Um, so Austin, welcome. Um, I'll turn it over to you and then we'll have the chat going um, simultaneously. So if folks want to submit their questions via the chat, they can do that there. And then um, after we're, after Austin's finished speaking, he'll take questions, which you can either, either submit to the chat and I can ask them um, from there if you'd rather do that, or you can unmute and ask directly. Uh, so with that, Austin, you take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so quick little note, I changed the title of my talk a little bit. I gave this talk last week to a group of rural progressives and uh, an older woman I was working with told me I needed to jazz up the title. So uh, I talked later on about the return of company towns, uh, modern day meatpacking towns. So we decided to call it big meat, small towns. Um, so yeah, my talk is basically about the deregulation of the American food system, how it happened and then what we can do from there. So just intellectually, I kind of want to lay out the two frameworks I'm going to talk about. It's really about the overlapping food policy frameworks with competition policy. And what I mean by frameworks is kind of a dichotomy in where Henry Wallace is kind of this New Deal. He was a New Deal uh, FDR's uh, USDA secretary, and his whole framework was balancing. How do you produce just enough? So business has affordable inputs, farmers make enough living, and you balance the ecological needs of the environment. Fast forward, the Earl Buck framework is very much, and he was Nixon's uh, USDA secretary, is very much rooted in overproduction of, of a few key things. Um, for competition policy, antitrust, Louis Brandeis, again, is more of a holistic balancing power demands, like deconcentrating political power, economic power, whereas Robert Bork is I just call it laissez-faire. But um, I mean, both this butts and fork framework is what I mean by the deregulation of the American food system. These two frameworks converge to kind of get us to where we are right now. Laissez-faire, I mean, you can call it second gilded age, um, kind of whatever you want to call this moment. And then I want to talk about what's next. I know Professor Jack Balkan has a new book where he believes we're on the cusp of another progressive movement. Um, I know the folks over at LPE at the law school are kind of wrestling with this. I mean, this to me is these laws of hair moments when they break and when they end are very, very dark. But the hopeful, the hope I have is usually in these moments is when a really a, a new structure can emerge. So it's talking about that. So let's start off with hogs. I love using hogs, hogs as an example of how broken the American food system is because it kind of captures everything wrong. 
where you have basically people that work on a slaughterhouse, their pay hasn't gone up in the past 30 years. You have for every dollar you spend the grocery store, the farmers received the least amount ever recorded. Um, bacon was cheaper under President uh, Truman than Trump if you adjust for inflation. But then you see CEO pay uh, of Smithfield make 290 million in 2017. So basically what you've seen is powers concentrated into a few people, more so over time. So kind of how did this talk came about actually was, uh, it started in this blog post I wrote for Slow Foods. Um, I, after graduating from grad school, I moved to DC. I was working at Treasury and my fiance and I loved this restaurant called Cava, like a fast casual kind of place. And I wondered why, why in Washington DC can I get a more healthy locally sourced meal than I could at most diners in Iowa? You know, you go to most diners in Iowa, it's all Cisco food. Um, so that kind of wrestling with that question led me to write that blog post. And then I just kept um, playing with this idea some more. I actually met Leah Khan when I was at Treasury. Um, she, I believe she was a law student at the time because I found an article she actually wrote called, uh, she wrote a really good piece on chicken, um, where basically it's about the 2010 failed hearing DOJ and USDA did. Um, and I kind of was really fascinated by it because to me, it was starting to explain a lot of the things I was seeing around me. And so I kind of wrestled with that idea some more. And that's how I wrote that American, this American conservative article. Um, I also want to say I was very intentional about putting it in a conservative publication because a lot of people have talked about this message of rebalancing the American food system, but it's always kind of framed in a very kind of, I, I would call it crunchy, progressive way, like kind of Mother Jones space. And Part of my intention of putting it in a conservative publication is just showing the unique bipartisan coalition you can build around restructuring these markets. And so I published a few pieces too since then in American Conservative. But what this presentation today is about is basically I took the idea from that article and I'm building it out into a book. Okay, so just like a little history about USDA. Um, actually, President Lincoln created it. it um, so for the Early years, USDA really was just basically an educational. Um, keep in mind, most Americans were farmers. It was disseminating information, um, financing a little bit of research, but it really didn't touch the markets. Um, basically, as America went west and took land, stole land from Native Americans, supply and demand was kind of like it was in balance. Um, things changed with World War One. Basically, when with uh, Europe in war, a lot of those fields were taken out of production. And so um, American farmers were asked to basically ramp up their production to meet the needs of our allies who couldn't produce food. Um, this is your classic supply and demand thing, where then guess what? Afterwards, those, those fields return to production and then those markets are oversupplied. Because you can't, once you make those capital investments to put certain land in production, you can't just then take it out. You have that kind of collective action problem where Sure, it makes sense for everyone to kind of pull back, but at that point, your input costs have risen, your land costs, all that kind of stuff. So basically what you see in the 1920s in America is depression hit, depression came, the Black Friday came early. And so you have these markets collapse, you have riots and like places in Iowa. I mean, there's a this riot up here on the left, made the front page in the New York Times. Um, they were called penny auctions. You also had the dust bowl occurring at the same time, where you had a lot of marginal land pushed in production for World War I um, that also overlapped with a rain spell. And then you saw in the 20s, um, that land was pushed too far. And then you saw that land collapse, you saw that great migration that happened. So then you have FDR comes into power. And um, one of the first, FDR also served, he was from the Hudson Valley, and he was also, as a state senator, on agricultural committees. So this was an interest of him. So one of the first things you see his administration do is look at these markets. He appoints Henry Wallace, who um, comes from a prominent Iowa family. He actually wrote his undergrad thesis on soil conservation. Um, his whole thing is basically creating a three-legged stool of conservation, paying farmers to conserve their land, crop insurance, subsidizing those premiums, and then price supports. Um, basically what this, people call this supply management, I call it the New Deal Farm Bill. Um, there's a lot of legislative history here that I'm kind of gonna shorten for time. Uh, 
the first part of it was basically to pay for this system. A tax was put on slaughterhouses um, that was ruled unconstitutional. By the way, I should say it was a former chairman of the Republican Party and Calvin Coolidge's campaign manager that was the head lawyer for that lawsuit who was financed by Big Meat. So this tension between farmers and agribusiness is goes back to, you know, it's just a, an inherent tension in this space. Because farmers want, they want balance, whereas corporations want to pay as least amount as possible. Um, but part of this system, this three-legged stool system, was they were all tied together. So the price supports basically said, we're going to guarantee you $3 for corn. So if it sells for $2.50 in the market, we'll give you 50 cents. But in order to get, or in order to get that, you have to engage in conservation practices. So there's carrots and strings going on here. I should also say though, I mean, this is something I learned doing this is how much, this is very much geared towards white farmers. Um, in the South, basically African-Americans um, did all the farming that the sharecroppers did. You basically had white landowners and this money was administered by the county. And so what you basically saw is a lot of the white landowners pocketing money and then kicking off the black sharecroppers. Um, there's kind of a famous moment with the Henry Wallace, where actually the USDA was a very progressive agency in the early years of FDR, but you had this tension come to the head where you had Henry Wallace side with the Southern Democrats who controlled Congress. Um, you actually had quite a few uh, people from Yale and Harvard at USDA crafting this, and you saw that tension come to a head in this, where Henry Wallace sided with the Southern landowners and allowed them to essentially push black sharecroppers off their land. Okay. I love this quote from Henry Truman. So Henry Truman gave a speech at the National Plowing Convention about an hour west of Des Moines, where he quote, this is his famous uh, reelect campaign whistle stop, it is terribly dangerous to let any one group get too much power in the government. We cannot afford to let one group share the nation's policy in its own interest at the expense of others. That is what happened in the 1920s under the big business rule of the Republicans. Those were the days when big corporations had things their own way. The policies that Wall Street big businesses wanted were the policies that the Republicans adopted. Agriculture, labor, and small businesses played second fiddle while business called the tune. I mean, I can give, go out and give that same speech to today. So fast forward a little bit. You have um, what I kind of created a dichotomy of a good and a bad. I, what I consider a bad farm bill is the 1996, Wall, what I call the Wall Street Farm Bill. Basically, President Clinton did what Reagan couldn't. He deregulated um, the farm bill. And what I mean by that is a lot of the strings over, over the years, and this didn't happen at once. This was slow. You saw little chips, little like tearing up part of the pieces over time legislatively. But 1996 was kind of like the big moment. Um, they called it it's Freedom to Farm is the other name for this. So a lot of the conservation strings were removed. So now you basically have people like in Northeast Connecticut where they, you know, you buy land, you put it into conservation, you get tax credits. Um, it's no longer tied to farming. You have price supports where instead of getting that, mark, that where you say you want $3, it basically subsidizes overproduction. And what I mean by that is under the New Deal Farm Bill, you take, they would take commodities out of the marketplace. So basically the government would buy it up, buy product, remove it from the marketplace to get the price at the desired out, you know, desired price. Wall Street Farm Bill basically says, we'll guarantee you a price floor, and then we'll just dump the surplus abroad. abroad. Um, and that's basically what you're seeing now with record farm bill payments is American farmers are just producing too much of a few things. And those marketplaces we used to sell abroad, mainly China, are just, it's just not fair. Um, crop insurance was greatly expanded too. It's like 70% of the premium you pay. It's heavily subsidized. So there's really, there's a lot of research into just, there's, you see a lot of marginal land put in production that shouldn't be put in production because the crop insurance is so good. And I should say, also say, even though this was just implemented in 1996, the idea for this goes back to Earl Benson. I mean, people in this space like to blame Earl Butts, Nixon, Beryl Butts actually was undersecretary for Benson under Eisenhower, and he comes out of agribusiness. They actually both do. And his book in 1996 was called Freedom the Farm. So just kind of going back to what I was mentioning earlier about how Big Meat financed the lawsuits that attacked the New Deal Farm Bill, you, you see this inherent tension that always plays out kind of
kind of in this space, or, or at least for the last century. So what this means for you is basically some food you eat is sub heavily subsidized and others are not. So carrots don't are not in this New Deal farm bill, whereas corn is. So that's why like this is from um, a Target like a month or two ago where you know you go in and get carrot juice. It is 13 cents an ounce, whereas the corn syrup, cranberry cocktail, and Pepsi is three cents. Um, I didn't even, I mean, I was kind of shocked to learn that cranberry juice is more unhealthy for you than pop. Um, just a little note is there are exceptions to this framework. Cranberry is one example. Um, cranberry is supply managed. Um, there's a few other agricultural commodities like that. But when you're buying cranberry cocktail juice, you're just buying sugar water. Like the cranberry is very actual little amount of the input. Also, I mean, part of this, this overproduction of a few key things is rooted in the American obesity epidemic. I mean, you can kind of, it's so clear in the data when you look at it, of just the obesity epidemic takes hold as we basically deregulate the food system and overproduce corn. I mean, Julia Guthman is the scholar here to read. Her whole book, weighing in, it's phenomenal. I highly recommend it. But it's basically the way we talk about obesity in America, it's a, it's a personal choice thing. And her argument is, no, 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 it's structural. Um, you walk into a dollar journal and you're not going to find a green pepper. Um, I also want to note this past winter, a very big study came out in the New England Journal of Medicine, basically predicting within the next 10 years, half of Americans will be obese, and not just overweight, but obese. Um, what you see here is basically it's predominantly going to be female, black, and lower income. And so very much to be healthy in America is you have to be well off. Um, and you just see it over here in these charts over here where you just see the obesity rates just, const just constantly increasing in America. I mean, and it's clear what it means for our health system and all that. Um, but what this system has also done is basically it's uh, as more and more energy and money is focused on a few commodities, it's basically pushed um, a lot of the vegetable production offshore. And what I mean by that is it's like a lot of you walk into um, wherever you get your produce. Um, most of it's coming now from Baja, California. And there's this weird tension where you're seeing progressives push for imp improved farm labor conditions. But what that's essentially doing is unless you deal with the trade agreement aspect of it, you're just going to push it offshore. So that's why your local strawberries in New Haven cost six, seven or eight dollars in the summer, whereas strawberries from Baja, California are a buck fifty. Um, and it's, it kind of mirrors, I would argue, the t-shirt the contracting model where you, you contract out four layers. So that way, when a company is caught with a 15-year-old making a shirt, Walmart, Walmart can be like, oh, I didn't know about it. It's the same thing here with tomatoes. And you're seeing like this, there's an incredible expose in the Los Angeles Times about this a few years ago, about how your tomatoes are grown. I mean, it's, it's children, it's chemicals they shouldn't use, it's everything wrong that you can imagine. And it's so hard to document. I mean, and then there's a there's been recent articles too on just you're seeing cartels basically get into avocados. Um, they call it um, for the same reason. So now kind of moving over to antitrust, I kind of use so I'm using Louis Brand Justice Louis Brandeis as one kind of one side of a dichotomy. And his whole thing basically is diffusing concentrated political economic power because of the political impl implications of that concentrated economic power. His background is really interesting because it really shapes his judicial philosophy where his father ran a grain thing in Kentucky. He then established a le his own legal practice in Boston. He was a corporate lawyer, um, but he famously fought Mellon um, over basically he, um, he smashed together 200 railroad monopolies in New England, including New Haven. Um, promise all these things. Um, Brandeis challenged at the time, being like, um, just really opposing this merger. And then everything he said would happen, happened. You had a lot of accidents. You saw a lot of debt. You saw a lot of journalists and politicians being bought out. Um, he really didn't believe in or, like non-organic growth. And what I mean by that is a company that gets big through acquisition. Um, and you really see this framework take hold in America. Um, just kind of for reference, um, when we talk about vertical integration, it's you know the retailer, the processor, the slaughterhouse, it's the supply chain, whereas horizontal is kind of you know across 
the 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 market space. And what I mean by that is like it's like Tyson. So it's like Tyson buying another chicken company would be a horizontal integration. Whereas vertical is like kind of what Costco is doing now. So if Costco is a retailer, but now Costco opened up its own chicken processing plant. So you know like those five dollar chickens at Costco, it's verticalizing that thing. We're essentially eliminating the farmer and trying to essentially control as much of that as possible. And that's a new thing you're seeing now in the food system where Walmart's doing the same thing with milk. So around Indiana, you have a whole Walmart dairy, Walmart cows, all that kind of thing. Um, what's interesting going back to the kind of Brandeis framework is um, actually, I think alcohol is a really good example of how you do vertical restraints. Um, so before prohibition, you basically saw a lot of beer companies sell product at cost or at loss. And the reason for that is basically when you get drunker, you spend, you're more loosey goosey with your money. And so basically they would get you drunk and then sell prostitution, gambling, all that kind of stuff. And there's a really good uh, Ken Burns um, prohibition. I think it's on Netflix. It really talks about this, but a lot of the social ills that came out of it sparked prohibition. So then when, once alcohol was legalized again, there are a lot of vertical restraints put into place where if you're a brewer, you couldn't distribute and you could not retail it. There are threshold caps, so if you're a craft brewer, you can do this, but it's a way to essentially diffuse power, separate these structures. Um, my dad used to be a beer distributor, so like I kind of grew up in that world. Um, and what you saw essentially, it's kind of like t local TV news where you carve up the US into these different little markets. But what we've seen kind of in this deregulation era is this system is kind of crumbling. Um, most famously is there's a congressman in Maryland called David Tronk. I think his name is, he's Western Maryland, a little bit of the DC suburbs, but he basically spent $40 million to buy a congressional seat. And he built a company called Total Wine. You might've seen it in strip malls, but he has financed lawsuits to essentially eliminate this system or put dents in it, I should say. But I like to use alcohol as an example of like, when we think about food or animals, it's how do we create structures that essentially diffuse or put diffuse power so that a common example in animal production, let's go back a slide, is not let companies own the animal. They call it a uh, packer ban, is what they call it. So like saying that Costco, you can't own a chicken. You can't slaughter a chicken you own. Okay, and the other kind of point I wanna make here, and it's kind of forgotten, but I think Tim Wu does a, a really good job talking about this in his book, Curse of Bigness, his role antitrust enforcement play post-World War II reconstruction by America. Um, IG Carbon is a company that was basically a chemical monopoly in Germany. It was Hitler's largest donor. And this board was, had a, trying to think how to say this, uh, a large portion of the board was Jewish. Hitler would walk into a room saying, oh, I don't mean that crazy stuff. I just want to help you sell more things. They write him a check. He goes off. Um, Auschwitz was actually built for this company as a labor source for its chemical production. Um, this book is incredible if you want to learn more about this history, but a big part after World War II was basically there was part of the Nuremberg trials was investigating IG Carbon. The company was broken up into multiple pieces, including modern day Bear, which just recently bought Monsanto. I use this as an example because it's an extreme example, but it can show you what can go wrong with concentrated economic power. As that economic power corrupts the political system, and how that can get out of hand really quick, really fast. Uh, I love this slide because uh, the phrase small business is catnip for almost every politician. It's too bad uh, you have all these presidents since Reagan um, saying how much they love small business, but it's too bad they don't actually believe in the regulatory system that rewards small businesses. What I mean by that is basically this whole Robert Bork model of antitrust, which is just, um, you're kind of seeing this battle play out real time between the Neil Brandeis um, who are challenging this framework. But basically his whole notion is just focus on price. If you can show that consumers will pay a lower price and merger gets approved. The Neil Brandeis critique is basically, this is, you can find any, any economist to produce the numbers you want. Most famously, there was a ProPublica story investigation into this and one economist made $250 million. Um, it's, the Neil Brandeis critique is generally the power is a moral decision and that people are using pseudoscience to mask moral judgments. Because um, the way you're gonna regulate hogs is just gonna be different than a, a search engine. 
So this is actually, you saw this even play on the presidential election with um, Elizabeth Warren taking a very much like a neo brand dicing approach. I should also say my personal belief is you can't separate someone's moral character for what they espouse. And I actually think I mean, Robert Bork's pretty clearly an awful man. I mean, he said homophobic, racist things. Um, <laughs> his last paper he wrote was Google was not a monopoly and it was financed by Google. Um, I just think it's hard to take someone's philosophy or framework seriously when their moral core is in question. And you saw that with Earl Butts. Um, Earl Butts g gave a very famous interview to Rolling Stone in the 70s where he just said pretty awful things. Um, so kind of tying these two, two together, these two frameworks kind of overlap to kind of give us this like deregulation in the American food system. Um, I, this book is by Smurge State by Suzanne Mettler is a really good kind of dive into this stuff where so much of this this is a critique you're seeing playing out now in Democrats right now between kind of the Bernie Hillary wings, where so much of it is you acknowledge there's an issue, but you don't actually challenge the structures or the power systems. You, you have a tax credit solution. It's kind of what she focuses on. And higher ed is the most famous example where instead of funding, funding higher ed more, we offer tax credits, which actually do the opposite of what you're intending to do because it just reinforces current power structures. Basically, only rich kids know that tax credits exist. So by failing to reinforce the system or challenge the system, you're reinforcing the power structure. Um, just kind of, so now I want to talk, this is just an example of like how Smithfield grew. And this is kind of what Brandeis feared. It wasn't natural growth. It was acquisition after acquisition after acquisition. Philip Howard at the University of, I believe it's Eastern Michigan, has a really good book on this, where it's just full of these incredible charts. Um, it's kind of documenting this. Um, here's just like a, a table on slaughtering house capacity for hogs or on um, Smithfield and JDS. I mean, not only can you see the different brands they own, their capacity issues. Um, what I actually find fascinating is both of these are state owned monopolies. Um, Smithfield is quasi owned by the Chinese state and same with JDS with Brazil. And so even if you're the number third American company, you're not even competing in a fair marketplace because those companies are getting unfair state support. And this is a very much a growing issue right now in antitrust, especially in agriculture. Um, here's another example of Whole Foods. Whole Foods just basically got become, became Whole Foods through acquisition after acquisition after acquisition. Um, the most famous book in this space, Omnivore's Dilemma about 20 years ago, famously said the way you change the system is, you know, you uh, change it with your fork. Um, guess what? I mean, it's, you go into any, who owns Whole Foods now? It's Amazon. You walk into a Whole Foods, basically every product you see is a premium line product of a big name brand. You know, Annie's is now owned by General Mills. Heck, even the kombucha company, I forget which one's called, is owned by Pepsi. Um, what's incredible is I actually find this chart on the left. I mean, this was taken in July. You just see how big Amazon is getting. You know, not only does it own Whole Foods, but now it's only it's even opening its own grocery stores called Amazon Fresh. Um, and kind of, kind of, let's talk about the impacts of this framework on the food system. So this is for that what I mentioned earlier about for every dollar you spend at the grocery store, what do farmers receive? So check it out. You basically see right before FDR takes over. 30 cents on the dollars what farmers got. Basically, by the end of Truman's presidency, it's at the highest levels ever, like 52 cents. And what you see is the systematic assault by, by big business to undermine the power of farmers. So now it's at the lowest levels ever recorded, 14 cents on the dollar. Um, the reason why the lines are different is there's a slight methodological change. And so that's why I kind of separated the data sources. Um, what also happened is basically farms went from diversified operations to basically producing two or three things. Um, I would actually compare this to like a retirement fund. It's like we went from a system where we had diversified holdings, like, you know, for retirement, you're supposed to own a bunch of things. So now basically you put it all on Amazon stock or all on green. Um, just how bad that is. Um, it makes you very susceptible to the winds of the economy. If you if you're if you just grow corn and soy and then you know those markets collapse, you're kind of up a creek. Um, what I find fascinating is there's these 
this thing on the left, um, part of the New Deal had this thing where FDR commissioned all these guides to every state. So wherever you're from, I really encourage you to look at the one for your state because they're like half Wikipedia, half travel guides. So what I found fascinating reading the eyeball one is you had very diverse supply chains and food production that hasn't lost. So like my hometown, my home state, um, I'm from Eastern Iowa, is Muscatine melons are a thing. There's a town called Muscatine, Iowa, along the Mississippi, very sandy soil, a lot, it's very famous for its melon. Um, sorry for the police iron. Uh, but I was reading this WPA guide, it, it taught, there was a whole section on agriculture and like Southern Iowa used to be peaches, Northern Iowa used to be beets, Western Iowa, we have these hills, um, there used to be wine production, Davenport, Iowa used to be onions. That's all gone. These localized supply chains have collapsed because of this system. Um, we also see too is basically the consolidation of farms and farm. Um, and kind of two points to note here is I had a farmer in Iowa point this out to me is what this means from like a living standard standpoint is it makes farming very, very lonely. So you go from 10 family farms on the street to two. What that means from like a rural sociological standpoint, but also what this kind of mask is you're also seeing land, the formation of land barons in America. Um, the most famous one, I think the largest land owner, farmland owner in America is the company that owns pistachio and uh, tangerine. I think they're called like Wonder or something. Um, they own hundreds of thousands of acres and I think they live in Hollywood or something. Um, you also seen the consolidation of animal production. Um, the 10 largest hog farmers in America now do two thirds of all hogs. What you see this chart on the right is basically har hog farms collapsed in the late 90s. Um, you have basically all, most animals now are grown in these metal sheds where they eat corn from above, defecate in a, loom, a lagoon below. They don't see sunlight. They don't even see a blade of grass. And none of the basically negative externalities are built into that price. So the family farmer who can't compete on that. Um, so they're all, you know, you saw the hog farmers driven out of business. And what's interesting about it is it's not like people talked about or at least like in the Iowa context, people don't talk about failing. They're like, oh, I failed at hog farming. It's either, oh, I got too old or the margins were too low. They didn't let their kids go into it. And you're actually seeing this play out right now in dairy. Dairy is collapsing in front of our own eyes. I'm gonna skip ahead to this chart. Um, most dairy production in America used to be concentrated in New York, Vermont, Wisconsin, that kind of region, where you know, cows on pasture, all that good stuff. But now you're seeing dairy move to the deserts of Mexico, Arizona, and Texas Panhandle, where you basically do these industrial dairy operations where you have thousands of cows in the desert. Um, you're pulling up water from the ground, you're trucking in hay, and you basically have undocumented men do all the, all the work. That family farm doing pasture-raised dairy cannot compete with a model like that. Um, so now you're seeing three times more dairy being produced in New Mexico than you are in Vermont. And, you think of Vermont and cows because of Ben and Jerry's, you don't think of cows in New Mexico. Um, what you're also seeing too is basically farmers used to be poorer than the average American household and now you're seeing them take off. But what this is a really, this is a really bifurcated stat. So it doesn't really capture what's going on here where you have, there is no middle class farmer really anymore. You have like the super rich ones that are, the few that survived this model where you, you, you have to produce a lot at very low margins to make it. And then you have like the CSA farmers who are like the only ones who really operate in the free market model because they don't really get any of the farm bill supports, but they're also basically giving away their labor. Um, you talk, it's a whole conversation for a different time, but a lot of CSA farmers will tell you their spouse pays the bills. Um, the margins are incredibly low. They do it out of love, but you can't really have that conversation because what you're selling partly in the CSA is you're selling an illusion, you're selling that image. And if you're frank about the pain you're in, you lose that illusion. Um, I mean, this is having all these spillovers where like Iowa, I, I compare, I mean, Iowa has a water quality crisis. This is the, the basically a river that goes through Des Moines. This is the, the Des Moines Waterworks. Um, right now, the guidelines is 10 parts per million for nitrate. More and more research is showing it should really be five. But what you're seeing like right now, and agriculture production in places like Midwest is you're seeing because this model 
rewards over production, you're seeing people farm right up to the creek. Um, so you see nitrates, they, they run off the field right away. You're then seeing all the manure from these like animal factories basically being sprayed onto the field. You know, rain comes along, whatever, it goes right into the creek. And kind of what to me, going back to the Brandeis thing of corrupting power, what he saw with the railroads is what you see here is, this is a very easy thing to solve. You plant cover crops, you put in buffer strips, but we cannot solve this issue because the power here is so concentrated. The second largest nitrogen fertilizer seller in America are the Koch brothers. Um, you've just seen like their economic power is corrupting the political system. And so like, I still laugh about this, but Des Moines Register had an article two years ago saying, quote, why does Des Moines smell like dog poo today? And basically as you had one CAFO farmer uh, west of town spray his field one day and the fumes went over the whole city of half a million people. Um, I should have said this earlier, but I should also say a lot of my talk is very much rooted in the American West, kind of a little bit on the South. Um, California is its own different agricultural system. So at least the Midwest had a family farm history. Um, California has always been kind of rooted in colonialism. Um, so I just kind of like one, in, whereas Midwest system is and South Southern system is really based on this subsidy system. The California system is very much based in a heavily subsidized water system. I just want to put that note because they're just very two different climates to keep in mind. All right, so labor. Um, there's a ton of good books on food labor, um, the most famous being The Jungle and Fast Food Nation. I really love Hog Wild. It's basically about Smith, uh, an attempt to organize the largest slaughterhouse in the world in North Carolina owned by Smithfield. Um, there's a really good book called Hamlet Fire 2 that talks about a, a modern day triangle fire that took place in, North, in a small town in North Carolina in the 90s, um, where pre predominantly um, black women died in a uh, chicken strip fire, chicken strip factory fire. Um, my key point here is, and it took me a little bit to realize, but like middle class, like a middle class job is a, a construct. There's nothing inherent about a middle class job. These middle class job is basically a byproduct of societal choices. So take slaughterhouses. That was a low wage job that we then you saw with the publication of the jungle, an effort made to empower these workers. So that job became a middle class job in the 50s and 60s. You saw workers making good middle class incomes, good benefits, all that stuff. And then you see the systematic assault on these, those workers, and so you saw their power decrease. And so what was once a low-wage job became middle class, went back to low-wage low job. And so I make this point because the food system right now is basically reflecting the bifurcation of the American system, where you have the have and have-nots. And we could make this a middle-class profession. Because it's, for me personally, is we need to stop just focusing on the farmer but also focus on the person who picks it, processes it, transports it, cooks it, and serves it. And if, once you start thinking about food that way, you're talking about one in 10, one in 11 Americans. Um, I love talking about peanut butter monopoly because I mean, you know things are bad is when there's a peanut butter monopoly. Um, the funny thing about this space is it's so hard to get good numbers. Um, the folks at Food and Water Watch told me about this one, but basically this is from like when you, Groceries when you when you buy something in a store and they scan it, so it's not capturing um, the the private label brands like the Walmart brand label. A lot of times the companies like Jiffy will also make the Walmart label, so this market share is probably much higher than 46 percent. But what you're seeing now is back in the day you had Standard Oil and it was just one brand, but you're seeing this like illusion of choice because that Whole Foods shopper doesn't want to buy the same brand as someone at Dollar General. Um, so you're seeing all these different like products, but they're, you know, it's all the same thing, really. Um, what you're also seeing now, I kid you not, there's this great story in Bloomberg Law last Thanksgiving being like every meat in America is under investigation for price fixing except turkey. And that includes, you know, tuna, salmon. But then I kid you not, two weeks after this, later after the story came out, turkey was investigated for price fixing. Because, um, I mean, Tim Wu has written about this. It's really easy to act like a cartel if there's basically three dominant firms in industry versus, you know, 20. Um, kind of looking at a bigger picture, what this means from a societal impact is basically 
as power is concentrated, you basically see rural parts of America become extraction colonies. And in that void or in that space, you've seen the politics of resentment get stronger and stronger. Um, there's a really good book by a UW, University of Wisconsin-Madison sociologist, I think it's called Politics of Resentment, that really gets at this. And Scott Walker was kind of the famous example of a politician who really tapped into this. Where instead of blaming the power, you blame, blame the teachers, or you know, find, blame the immigrants, that kind of system. Um, what you also see now too, is basically the rise of superstar cities. Um, there's a young academic at U University of Michigan named Robert Mundeka, who's done a lot of research in this. But it used to be basically what you see in the 80s in America is life in you know, Dayton, Ohio was not that much different than life in San Diego. But what you see now in America is you have superstar cities, metropolitans are taking off. So for like every, let me take DC, you have five or six richest counties in America are DC suburbs. For every DC, there is St. Louis. You have like a, a, a metropolitan that is struggling. Um, I actually find it fascinating too that M Minneapolis is one of those superstar metropolitans. My guess is it's probably medical devices that's driving it. I believe Medtronic's headquartered there. And if you want to talk about monopolies, look into medical devices. Um, and so kind of going back to this politics of resentment is basically you're seeing just the social decay that Robert Putnam taps into with Bowling Alone in a lot of these rural communities where you just see, you know, the opioid, the like drugs kind of fill that void. And you're seeing, in, you know, the huge increase in suicide rates, Medicaid, paying for um, births and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is a kind of a little interesting stat too, is the loss of local ownership with consolidation. So here, a young man at Harvard from Iowa did this thing on Keokuk, his hometown, the little town that used to vote Democrat when Obama, Obama, and then went Trump, where you had, he looked at the 1960s in the town, and you had about half the businesses were locally owned. Fast forward to 2016, none of them were. This, this is, um, it's, it just doesn't show, an, show up in an Excel sheet, but it's, when the CEO's kid is on the same baseball team as the workers, that changes the dynamics. When, what you basically have now is a model where you have McKenzie consultants looking at an Excel sheet in Minneapolis saying, I want this labor fired. Um, to me, a really famous example of this is in Creston, Iowa. Um, there's a candy company, you know, those trolley gummies, those are made there. Company was bought out and they fired their employees 10 days before Christmas. You have a candy company, fire, like, why not wait till February? I mean, to me, this example shows you just the heartlessness of this moment, the inability to respect labor. Like you don't see these people as people, they're just a line item on an Excel sheet. Um, kind of going back, this is going back to the big meat small towns. Um, I actually did my undergrad thesis on this is a lot of the slaughterhouse towns in Iowa are basically modern day company towns. And so here's just a few, the triangles represent where they are. And what you also notice is those are also the poorest parts in the state for free and reduced lunch rates. You have districts that are basically 70 or 80% um, minority students with 70, 80% free and reduced lunch rates. And if you're following the Iowa Senate race right now with Joan Aarons, her hometown too is one of the poorest parts. That's what that little star represents. I should also say just one funny anecdote from those towns is I've spoken to a lot of those mayors, superintendents, and all that in those towns, and they will tell me about all the problems they face educating, you know, low-income students, and what basically the social, like the wraparound services the schools then have to provide to address those needs. But the second you bring up the slaughterhouse, they'll tell me how great they were. Oh, they gave us free hot dogs for our cook-off, yada, yada, yada. There's not that, whereas in the back of my head, I was thinking, well, just pay your workers more, you don't have to deal with that problem. But I mean, there's, there's, there's a whole literature in political science on power dynamics on the, on the third face of power where those towns are just so desperate for jobs because every other town around them is dying that they are just happy to have something. So how dare they bite the hand that feeds them? I mentioned earlier, I did run for Congress in Iowa focused on the Bear Mountain Council merger. Um, the challenge, kind of what I heard a lot is a lot of people loved it, but you're seeing two dynamics play out here. You're also seeing the concentration of the media ecosystem and the, and the collapse of it in front of our own eyes. 
So getting this message out there is a number one super hard. I mean, like instead of earning media, you have to buy media now. I mean, that's why the Iowa Senate race this year will probably cost $200 million. Um, and that you basically at that point have New York money, New York finance money fighting New York finance money. Because as money is extracted from these towns, the money's not really there. There's not real money in Iowa. Maybe there is some in Des Moines, but you're seeing more and more of the profits flow to the coast. So you see these financial times battle it out. Um, what I also heard a lot too is like a lot of people, it's kind of a, it's a lost art. I mean, you're seeing antitrust come back in vogue because of big tech. Um, so what I did is actually after my campaign, I organized um, the first presidential forum for the 2020 cycle up in Storm Lake, Iowa, which is another one of those slaughterhouse towns. Um, our goal here was basically put antitrust on the map. So to no one's surprise, Elizabeth Warren was the first person out with a plan to tackle this issue, saying we need to, we need to confront corporate consolidation. Um, here's a copy, a screenshot of all the plans. You basically had every candidate, including Joe Biden, by the summer have agriculture antitrust in their plan, confronting this corporate power. Um, I just want to make a quick little note. Cory Booker has this great phenomenal book, Bill, I'm kind of obsessed with, which is basically banning the construction of new, I don't like to use the term CAFO because it's who know, like, what does the word CAFO mean? It's like the word H2As. CAFOs is just a metal shed, a corporate farm, call it, you know, call it what it is. Don't, by using industry terms, very technical language, you lose meaning of what it actually is. So H2As are just a fancy way of saying indentured servitude. Um, but basically, Cory Booker's bill would um, ban the construction of them, phase them out over 20 years, and forgive a lot of the debt current debt from the construction of them and put animals back on the land. I love this bill. I mean, first of all, the meat tastes better, it's better for the environment. It's also an incredible rural development bill because you can have one you know, factory farm or you can have 10 pig farm families. Um, so that, and also everything I heard is, I was very, I'll be honest, I was very, I didn't trust Cory Booker at first. His first, one of his co-chairs in Iowa was a former Monsanto lobbyist. But from everything I've heard is his experience doing the Iowa caucuses and seeing firsthand how broken this stuff is really shaped him. And this bill is a byproduct of that experience. And so he truly is a champion in this space now. I mean, he's reintroducing a lot of old Paul, Paul Wellstone language. Um, just to kind of wrap up is this Frederick Douglass quote. If there is no struggle, there is no progress. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. So as we kind of, this moment, this will not, this, this system just won't change on its own. It will be a fight. But to me, is what gives me hope is what the system could be. Um, so I, I kind of like to end on like what you could do. Um, number one, I think the best way to change this system is actually focus on school meals because it's really hard to talk about supply chains with people, but it's really easy to talk about school meals. I mean, we're building on the work of Michelle Obama. So imagine if all of the milk served in or at Yale came from pasture-based dairy, those huge supply chains, because putting a green pepper in a Dollar General doesn't change anything because if people, if their incomes are still stagnant, they're going to pick the more processed food that's cheaper. But the procurement power of large institutional buyers could really shape these systems. Um, to me, like my dream here would be someone go to a local community college, study culinary, go back to where they're from at their school district and make a made from scratch meal from locally sourced ingredients. What I love about this vision is first of all, what a, you're elevating labor, you're respecting labor. And so, so instead of cooking frozen pizza, you're letting someone build a craft and you're rewarding that craft. Um, it's positive. I think people right now in these dark times really crave a positive vision. Um, but also it's a good reminder that what we have now is radical. Like, this vision is not radical. The system where animals are in a metal shed and never see a blade of grass, where the richest soil in America has some of the highest free and reduced lunch rates, that is radical. Um, the second thing I suggest is state attorney generals. Um, Write a letter to your AG just asking them to hire more people. I mean, this is so simple, but in Iowa, um, the number two in the office is a Yale Law grad. He read Leah Khan's article in the Yale Law Journal. He's like, oh, this is really interesting. And he, they hired two attorneys. You're basically hiring more cops in the beat. Because there's always going to be, there's tons of instances where 
AGs want to go down the road. They just don't have the resources. Um, and kind of like my vision for the next farm bill is I, this is a little controversial in this space, but I don't really believe in supply management. Um, I don't think a government entity should say we should produce X amount of corn. What I want to move to is more of a stewardship payment model where it's basically, here's a toolkit. Here's the same pot of money. We'll give you X amount if you do cover crops. So we'll give you Y amount if you do prairie strips. Um, let people pick what works best for their, for their land. Um, just because when you start playing that supply management game, you start, I mean, that's, some people might argue like ethanol is a byproduct of that because basically we, we were producing too much corn and we made an artificial demand to soak up that surplus. Um, that's kind of what I'm thinking. So yeah, this is kind of my vision. And uh, I like, so the reason why there's an Iowa and Italy photo here is I, I gave this talk and I think I mentioned this already in Iowa last week. And um, Des Moines is a lot like Hartford. They're both insurance towns, but I was like, there's no reason why Iowa shouldn't be a foodie tourist destination like the way Italy is. I mean, you're, you kind of see it right now in the Hudson Valley um, in New York. And why not? There should be more of these in America where you have, you build on the strength of these communities to make them better. So yeah, um, that is my presentation. Sorry, that was a lot. And I probably talked really fast. It's a bad habit, but I'm happy to take questions now.